God's great mercy and peace are yours from God our Father, and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for proclamation is the gospel reading from Luke chapter 4. I'd like to read it again for you from the contemporary English version of the Bible. When Jesus returned from the Jordan River, the power of the Holy Spirit was with him, and the Spirit led him into the desert. For 40 days, Jesus was tested by the devil, and during that time, he went without eating. When it was all over, he was hungry. The devil said to Jesus, If you are God's son, tell this stone to turn into bread. Jesus answered, The scriptures say, No one can live only on food. Then the devil led Jesus up to a high place and quickly showed him all the nations on earth. The devil said, I will give all this power and glory to you. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. Just worship me, and you can have it all. Jesus answered, The scriptures say, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Finally, the devil took Jesus to Jerusalem and had him stand on top of the temple. The devil said, If you're God's son, jump off. The scriptures say, God will tell his angels to take care of you. They will catch you in their arms and you will not hurt your feet on the stones. Jesus answered, The scriptures also say, Don't try to test the Lord your God. After the devil had finished testing Jesus, in every way possible, he left him for a while. Or as our text also said before, an opportune time. Wait for the opportune time. Tempting and testing is the theme for the message today. And on this first Sunday in Lent, as on every first Sunday in Lent, the gospel readings about the temptation of Jesus. So if you've ever been to church on first Sunday in Lent, this has always been the gospel reading. Probably heard it a hundred times. Well, you're not that old yet. But once a year, right, on the first Sunday in Lent, we've heard this story over and over again. It may be we already know what's going to be talked about. You know, he was tempted about food. He was tempted about power. He was tempted about glory. You know, but don't hold out for that. Maybe there's some surprises yet for you ahead. You know, even the whole thought of Jesus being tempted. Now, we know that a word commonly is used that someone or something that tries to get us to do something you shouldn't. Or maybe to do something we should have done and we didn't do it. If you think of your own experience, you can probably see that temptation can often rise from within yourself. For example, maybe I'll sleep in this morning. I mean, it did snow, right? You know, it might be hard to get to, to get to church or get to school or get to work or, you know, is it really going to be too much trouble to go the extra mile for effort for someone? But at the end of our account from Luke, we're told that when the devil had finished every test, he departed from him, from Jesus. Now, the temptations are described as tests. The Greek word for temptation is also the same Greek word for test. So depending on the context, we translate it either temptation or test, depending on the context. Now, while tempting a person, trying to get a person to do something wrong is bad, testing someone does help them Get, grow in their trust of God is in fact a good thing. That's not bad. Putting God to the test is wrong though because it means that there's a failure to trust God if we're saying, God, I don't I want you to do this for me. If you don't, I'm not going to trust you. We don't want to test God like that. But testing can be good. When you pass a test, whether it's in school or your driver's exam or anything else, it's a sign that you've accomplish something. You have achieved a level of skill and qualification. Even if you fail a test, you also have a realistic evaluation of your skill set. That these are things I need to improve on if I want to pass this next level or have my abilities tested to see where I need to improve. We even test ourselves. Taking on tasks we're not sure we can accomplish. And so we take, see, I don't know if I can do this, but with God's test I hope, to help, I hope I can. So in our context of our text today, is Jesus being tempted or tested? Now it may seem obvious that the devil is trying to get him to sin. I mean, obviously that was one of the devil's number one goals. If I can get Jesus to sin, then he cannot die in place for all of us. So think about that. Jesus lived for 33 years in life. Every single day of his life, the devil is trying to get him to sin so he couldn't save us. Wow. That's a lot of pressure on a guy. And here Jesus is being tempted 
especially time of weakness, right? He was weak because he hadn't eaten for 40 days. I mean, the text is kind of funny, right? You know, he hadn't eaten for 40 days. He was hungry. Really? I'm such, so surprised about that. You know, why would you just be hungry? You know, he hadn't eaten for 40 days. But the part that we, we assume or you think about is that, well, of course he could turn that stone into bread. But that really wasn't the issue. Even though he had the power and could, he didn't. And the reason why the devil asked him to do that wasn't so he could feed himself, but was he going to truly trust God to take care of his needs? Because that was really the question at hand. Are you going to trust God? You know, we say you're son, God's son. Are you going to trust God or not? Now, one of the problems we have these days is that we see the devil as a far-off kind of guy. You know, at the very least, uh, we know that there's evil in the world. You don't have to go very far to know there's evil in the world. Bad things happen. People do terrible, awful things in our world today. There is evil in the world. No doubt about it. But to call it the devil is something different. TV's even tried to soften the image. And, you know, for most of us, when we think of devil, we think of a guy in a red suit with a pointed tail and a pitchfork, right? And he's more of a comic character than he is a real-life person. Uh, they've made him kind of real life in a TV show on Fox called Lucifer. You know, and he goes to um, L.A. for vacation from hell. So I guess, I don't know if that's really vacation. That's like going to hell, I guess, in some places. That's hotter than hell right now in Southern California. Uh, but uh, Lucifer is kind of being called uh, as, a, as a normal person. He's got feelings and cares about people, and he's trying to tempt them and sin, but now he's, he seems less than evil, though. He's funny. He jokes about things. He's trying to get people uh, at the heart of their lives where their strongest desires are, uh, whether they're going to trust in God or not. And we don't think about ours having a personal devil that really wants us to turn from God and turn towards whatever temptation we may have in our lives, especially when we live in a world that has a scientific matter to try to prove everything. How can you prove there's a devil? We can definitely prove there's evil, but the devil is something else. Well, in our text, not only is he called the devil, he's called the Satan. And in the Old Testament, having that uh, definite pronoun there, that article in front of definite article, the Satan means the accuser, the adversary. Someone's trying to say, you're not good enough. You sinned too much. God's not going to forgive you this time. That's what Satan does, the Satan. And in two places in the Old Testament where that's mentioned, first is in the opening chapters of the book of Job. And in that case, uh, here uh, the Satan is among all the guys up in heaven who are talking about Job. Well, he's a faithful God, guy, and the Satan says, well, that's because you're so good to him, God. Let me have Adam. He'll deny you. And so he's accusing. He's given the job to test Job's faithfulness by bringing disasters upon him. It's as if he's running a sting operation to prove that Job isn't really as righteous as he says he is. And his sting fails. Job complains to God, but he doesn't lose his faith. In the third chapter of Zechariah, the high priest Joshua is being accused of some crime by the adversary. But God says, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan. So in both these passages, the Satan seems like an overly zealous prosecuting attorney. He's trying to get innocent people into trouble. But by the time of our gospel, Satan is definitely an evil figure. He has moved, if you wish, from being a prosecutor, prosecutor willing to pad his uh, resume by convicting innocent people to being a completely corrupt district attorney. He's in rebellion against God. He's trying to overthrow the government. And now he wants to corrupt the one, the one that God sent, who was sent into the world, his only son. But as he tempts Jesus, God is using the temptations as testing, showing Jesus what he will face in his mission and giving him opportunities to see that he can see, succeed before the final conflict comes. So that's what happens. Jesus has been hungry. He tries to get tempted. You know, if you're our son to God, you can turn these stones into bread. Jesus sees through that question. And not just whether he can get some food is really the issue. So he replies by quoting Deuteronomy, something that the Israelites were told when they complained about not having food. One does not live by bread alone. We live by the creative 
and sustaining power of God. That's why it's important to be in Bible study. That's why it's important to be in prayer. Uh, for those of you who went to Ash Wednesday services on Wednesday, how many of you have been praying the Lord's Prayer three times a day? Here we are. I saw some ladies at Ladies 8. I've already prayed twice today, Pastor. Uh, that's our goal. You know, in, lot, in Lent, a lot of times we try to give up something for Lent. You know, candy or pop or something like that or other things. And uh, we try to, instead of giving up something, we can do something. We can do some kind of acts of service or love. Uh, we can also do the Lord's Prayer three times a day. It's easy for me, especially on days when I have shut-in calls. I may I say the Lord's Prayer four or five times. Every time I give communion, I get to say the Lord's Prayer with people. But to pray it in such a special way that I think about the petitions and put individual things there, thinking about thy kingdom come and thinking about the nations of the world or thy, thy will be done for those who need God's special care in this world. So being in God's word, and obviously Jesus was. You know, Jesus knew the word, and here Satan's tempting him, and he uses the word against him to say, get behind me. I'm not going to give in to you. Uh, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And then that's what he does the next time. First the devil's so subtle and say, hey, aren't you hungry? Why don't you make some stones and the bread? This time he says, hey, I can give you all power. And Jesus doesn't say, well, hey, your power comes from my father. You can't do anything without him allowing you to. Instead he says, don't worship you. I'm not going to worship you. I'm going to worship the true God. That's the only one to serve. So the third temptation, Satan finally catches on. Okay, you're going to throw Bible verses around. Hey, I've got one for you. Let's go up to the top of the, uh, the temple, and you, why don't you jump off? Because there's that scripture from the Psalms that says, he'll send his angels to protect you. Let's see if God will protect you. And then what does he say? He uses the scripture again. Thou will not test the Lord your God. It wasn't, again, scripture is not useful in every circumstance, but in every circumstance, God does provide his word to sustain us. And in Jesus' case, he wasn't using those scriptures as a magic formula for keeping the devil away. He was using them as a way to sustain himself, to succeed in trusting God completely by using God's word. So, the temptations are over. They're finished, except that the devil isn't finished. We're told that he departed from Jesus until an opportune time. He was tempted every day. And the ultimate temptation was on the cross. We know in our own lives a temptation once defeated may return. But we also know a test successfully passed can prepare us for something more difficult ahead. If I can get through the kitchen without eating those chocolate chip cookies, you know, maybe I can get through there when there's donuts on the shelf too. Okay? So you know, God prepares you for more difficult things ahead through the things that you succeed in doing. And so that's what Jesus does. He goes off from this situation, sustained by God and his word. He knows he can handle the next tougher situation. And so he goes off in his mission. He picks his 12 disciples. He tells them about God's plan of salvation. Uh, Peter, you know, acknowledges, hey, you're the Christ, the son of God. And then Jesus decides to tell him, hey, you know, by the way, being the son of God and being the Messiah means I have to go to Jerusalem and die for your sins. And what does Peter say? God forbid that happens. And what does Jesus say? Get behind me, Satan. Not that Peter was Satan, but he was working for the guy. He was doing what the devil wanted him to do. He wanted to tempt Jesus to say, you can't do this. It's too tough for you. You don't want to do this job. And that's what he tried to say. You get behind me. I have a task to do. Jesus is ready, and the tempter fails. And then the truly opportune time, the time that mattered the most, when the rubber met the road, was the last time Jesus was tempted. Imagine what that's like. Hanging on the cross, dying for the sins of people that repent, don't repent, and have rejected him. People mocking him, spitting at him. Wouldn't it be easier, as a son of God, to come off that cross and not die for our sins? Sure it would have been. But again, on this Valentine's Day, it wasn't nails that held him on the cross. It was his love for us. And so when the devil came in that last temptation and said, don't go through with it. It's just too tough for you. He says, no, I'm going to stay here and I'm going to love these people and I'm going to die for them and I'm going to pay the price for every one of their sins. He did not give in. He is the Messiah. He is the one who will sustain us through all temptations. Because Jesus didn't come down from the cross, he remains faithful to God. 
He remains faithful to his mission. And on the third day, he will rise because God remains faithful. Amen.